This morning's session is about char as invaders, invasives, or, and or the management of char. Um, our keynote speaker starting us off is Dan Schill. He'll be talking about um, chars as exotic invaders in the western United States. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm, I felt compelled to at least mention the other uh, species that is present in our state in this talk, at, and that is the bull trout. I'm going to give a very brief uh, discussion of them at the beginning, then move on to invaders, uh, these two uh, species. And uh, then I'm going to talk for the last half of my talk about a way we are working on in my agency to, to combat them. Uh, it's a big uh, project for my agency. I wanted to thank everybody up front and not forget, especially Liz Mamer, pictured here. She helps with my talks and also is working on everything with me on YY Fish. You notice Mike Hansen's listed there. He's not a fishing game employee, but a lot of the time it seems like he is. He helps us a great deal, so I figured he wouldn't mind if I put him in there with the rest of the fishing game crew. So uh, bull trout were, were listed in our state in the late uh, 1990s in four states. We now know there are 600 populations of those fish. We didn't know that then. Um, and this is what the coterminous listing area looks like. We're here, we're the international folks. Uh, I saw a map yesterday or the day before on this too. That's the listing area. Covers four states, very broad. Again, now we know there are 600 populations out there. The young bull trout biologist at the time working for Idle Fish and Game, that, that's me there without a lot of gray hair. Uh, we did some work in uh, summarizing in the early 1990s what we had for bull trout data. And I summarized it in this report, and as you can see, it didn't look real good. This was information that the Fish and Wildlife Service was very interested in. This was some of the key information initially used uh, to help list bull trout. Um, and we have some very good long-term data sets. And this one, this Rapid River Trap one, is, is the same information that was help, used to help list bull trout. You can see it looks pretty grim right there. Uh, but then it doesn't look very grim. You just need a longer data set. And I've, I kind of thought about this, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump was here yesterday and he likes to take credit for things that he hasn't much to do with. I and mean, he'd seen that, he'd probably want to take credit for that. Um, but I would just like to note that Obama had first dibs on that. So um, in all seriousness, this is an issue because when we have these other data sets, including the other one I showed you in that prior page that looked like they were down, I could show you a graph, it looks exactly the same. And it turned out that we have some weather or climate effects on bull trout across the landscape. And so many of them aren't declining. As a matter of fact, in Idaho, in my home state, they aren't declining at all. And so we've published two papers over the last two decades. We know that there's at least one and a half million, probably two. This is a very conservative estimate in the one paper at the top. Most of the populations are at or near carrying capacity. We simulated that with Dr. Oz Garten. And so the risk of, of uh, their going away is very low. So I just want people to get the idea that in, in many, many parts of the listed range, uh, bull trout are, uh, are doing pretty darn good. Others, it's tough. So I, I love bull, brook trout. I want everybody to know I'm, I've been spending a lot of time uh, trying to get rid of them. But, but, I, but I'm, a, I'm a trout biologist because of that little stream on the upper left. It's Clear Creek in Pennsylvania. It was on that stream when I was a teenager that I decided I wanted to be a trout stream biologist, and it was the brook trout that I fell in love with. And for the last 12 years, I've been trying to engineer a, a way to uh, kill them all So in the West. So it, I, I, I'm conflicted, or maybe it, it, it's maybe taking its toll on me. But, um, but the bottom line is uh, I, I've been working on these fish now f since, uh, I guess, 2008. And I'm going to talk a little bit about brook trout in streams as an invader and in high lakes. We're a very good dispersal agent. Um, unfortunately, uh, they were introduced uh, across the West initially by train, uh, by the U.S. Fish Commission, which eventually becomes the Fish and Wildlife Service. We stocked them into streams. You can see the photo there. Uh, and you end up uh, with the upshot. Uh, this is a, a widely cited study by McCrimmon and Campbell, but you can see in the Western U.S. Uh, we've, we definitely have uh, more, more brook trout than we need. Uh, they're basically all over the place. And another example, my good friend Russ Thoreau published a paper, and this isn't the greatest map, but you can, this 
again, we're here. This is the area, this is the Columbia River. You can see how widely brook trout are distributed. You know, we know they invade, and there are a lot of people publish on it. These are three folks that have said, yeah, but it's unclear. We don't really understand why that is. Um, there's been some really good work out there. Uh, some, my major advisor, Jack Griffith, uh, in 72 did his doctoral work on it. He, he said it was competition, predation. Here's a, uh, Dunham noted that boy, all three of these things, uh, brook trout have the advantage, and he suggested that it's just a straight uh, top dynamics issue, this displacement of native cutthroat. Jack Griffith did, did some work in the donut uh, it's an ingenious created tank, and, and he saw that a 20 millimeter size advantage always resulted in a win, an agonistic win by brook trout over West Slope cutthroat. They're a fall spawner, and in the field he saw that size advantage maintained throughout time. So that was his idea. Uh, you know, uh, Susie Adams did some really good work. Uh, I think Kurt Fausch had written a paper earlier suggesting that maybe three hypotheses. One, that brook trout are poor swimmers, and that that's why you don't see as many brook trout in very high elevation, high gradient streams. And Susie saw these brook trout sailing over 1.2 meter falls. They, they climb these, uh, uh, these high gradient cascades, and, and they, they survive 18 meter uh, downstream uh, uh, collisions with the substrate. Kurt Fausch did a lot of work on, on invasions. If he's out there, I'm nervous even talking about it because he knows a lot more than I do. Uh, and these are a number of his graduate students and mostly PhDs. The, the last one might be, might, he might consider it his star grad student, I really don't know, but he published a paper recently saying, well, when, when eradication is not an option, and, and he basically, I think they were saying, we might have to punt trying to get rid of them because we're not very good at it but he did model some ideas on how to at least keep them suppressed. And I think they may, that work may have some good um, utility in the work that I'm doing with my staff that I'll get to you in a minute. So, uh, but these papers all say that there's, that there's a recruitment bottleneck. And if you look, there's three different species on the right uh, of, of subspecies of cutthroat trout. In each of those studies, Jack's on the top was for West Slope. The middle one, uh, Peterson, Rio Grande's, uh, and then they all talk about a bottleneck for recruitment, and this last one says right, there's a bottleneck for a brief interval, but no one in these papers seems to say when that bottleneck is. They don't really identify it, and perusing around in the literature this, uh, for this uh, symposium, I, I, really, I really have long thought that the bottleneck is winter, and if, if anybody's a trout stream biologist and have not looked at that, that uh, that movie called A Trout Stream in Winter, you need, a, you need to do it, or if you're a professor, get your students to read it. Bob Butler put it together. It was put together in the 70s. But it, it, it'll show you where the bottleneck is, I think. This is some work I've done out there uh, in, in the middle of the winter with some of my staff. Kevin Meyer, the guy I work with a lot, he, he's got paper out there looking at brook trout, overwinter survival, and ra rainbow trout, and it's, it's all about the size. Uh, you got to be big, and so I think that is where the the, the bottleneck is, and, and maybe Kurt Fausch has a paper out there that's already said that. I don't know. So management in these things, uh, and, and brook trout invasions in streams, is very difficult, and people try a lot of things. We've tried pheromones uh, in our agency and elsewhere, that, and, and trapping fish with pheromones that doesn't work. Electrofishing removal is successful in a few waters, as uh, you can see there with Shepherd. It's usually unsuccessful. Um, Meyer, uh, Kevin Meyer and I published a paper in which we described uh, uh, trying to remove brook trout as a quixotic enterprise. And if, if you have to be a Man of La Mancha fan to know what we're talking about there, but, but basically you, you can do it for a long time. It, it, I'm not sure it makes much sense, um, with the exception of uh, maybe what I'll show you in a little bit. Um, success in only segments less than five kilometers. We, I cannot find a place where anybody has successfully removed, brook, eradicated a brook trout population, anything over. Uh, five kilometers. Piscicides will work. They're expensive. The public has a lot of concerns about them. It's getting harder and harder to use them. Alpine lakes, we again were the dispersal agent. We used horses and uh, we, we got them into high lakes and again in the early 1900s and we figured out plains and we, we stocked them in plains. Uh, California was the leader in that, I think, followed by Idaho. And, it, you know, it's very hard to get rid of them in, in high lakes. Uh, gill netting works, again, it's only in the small lakes where we've seen success. 
it takes over 100 gill nets for water in a whole summer or a year or two uh, in some of these uh, published studies uh, to get it to go. Uh, we have tried sterile muskie, believe it or not, and have published on that, and we did eradicate brook trout in four out of 13 lakes, but they're sterile, but then you do have to get rid of them. You've got to get out there and do it, and it's inconsistent. So in, in terms of brook trout invasion, uh, they're, they're highly infected, uh, effective invaders. We don't have consistent eradication tools available. It costs you a fortune, um, usually for uh, you know, results that aren't very satisfying. You just suppress if you're lucky. And it's just pretty hard to make progress across the landscape in meaningful terms when you're spending so much money on five kilometer reaches. Now I'm going to talk about something I don't know much about. I, 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 I'm a stream trout uh, biologist. Uh, fortunately, Martinez uh, wrote a paper out there. Uh, uh, you can see the Western Lake, lake Trout Woes uh, uh, kind of heading on it. This was published in Fisheries. There's over 200 lakes in the west of the U.S. now that have these uh, exotic lake trout. Uh, it usually doesn't go real good for native salmonids. That's not always the case, but uh, mysids exacerbate the problem. And, and if you look at the map, the ones with the little X's on them up there are the ones that these little X's are where we've introduced mysids. Uh, our fish managers in the mid, uh, the, you know, mid 60s, late 60s got this good idea. Well, it's not a good idea. Um, you can see here uh, the densities of mysids in Lake Pend Oreille, which you're going to hear about more in a minute. Uh, they shift food resources away from kokanee, and they increase lake trout survival. So the over-harvest paradigm, everyone knows about that if you're a lake trout biologist, uh, and even if you're not, he leaves a mortality greater than 0.5, they're going to decline. It's pretty easy to exploit them, overexploit them in their native range, and we're finding it's not so easy in, in uh, non-native. We don't have the fishing power that that uh, that people do back east. This is definitely true in Yellowstone. These are a couple of the gillnet boats that they they have there. There's a third one that they uh, I think a custom one they had built. But but getting enough fishing power on these things is very difficult if you're an agency. And uh, Mike mentioned this yesterday. If, if you wanted. If you really want to deal with the invasives out west, you've got to hire the pros. And Idaho Fishing Game was the first one to do that. Uh, I think you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Um, uh, Hickey Brothers Research, it's, it's, if you're a char biologist, it's probably a grim scene, but, but it, it, you really need to, to get after it with the right kind of people. And you also need to use the Judas Fish approach. And this uh, picture is uh, um, of Andy Ducks, who's going to be speaking second. He did his master's in Montana with, uh, with Chris Guy. And you can see he did radio telemetry. And what, what Andy found is that surprisingly, after all this movement, that all the spawning in this lake occurred in two tiny spots in that lake and that maybe we can suppress. And so that has, was the beginning of the Judas Fish approach for lake trout that Idaho Fishing Game has successfully deployed. And I'm not going to try to steal these guys thunder, but you can see that we were faced with a grim situation and it didn't take us very long to suppress them back down to considerably lower levels. And you can see the result of that in, on the graph on the right in terms of a, a recovered uh, kokanee population. Uh, and Yellowstone, you know, they, they did a different uh, uh, approach. They didn't hire anybody for a while. They didn't use uh, the Judas Fish approach. And they messed around for a long time until they really started to have an effect. This was biomass of the fish removed. Uh, they hired the Hickeys in 2009. And it was about 2012 when they really, the Hickeys got going. And you can see the result. So once they got the commercial guys and their skills, and recently started using the Judas fish approach to really get on them. Um, it really uh, sped the process. So uh, in summary then, lake, uh, lake trout, uh, when, it's, when it's required, it's very expensive. Uh, Yellowstone's spending about $2 million a year. And we're spending about half of that. And you know, the big question is, is this sustainable and can we can we cut these costs? And you're going to hear a great talk by Mike Hansen on some modeling that our staff are doing with him um, that start to answer some of those questions coming up uh, shortly. 
So the final tale, I, I, I have a, this, this is a tale uh, that we've been working on our agency for 12, uh, 10 to 12 years now. Uh, but actually, we really started on the, the YY stuff in 08. So actually, it's only been a decade, but we've been, we've been pecking away at it uh, ever since. Um, and I think I mentioned that, you know, it's hard in streams to make much progress or lakes. We have a 20% success rate in eradicating uh, these invasive brook trout in our state, hence the quixotic enterprise quote we got in this paper um, that I uh, show you at the top there, the paper by Meyer. Uh, and we just, we just uh, the, the successful ones have always been uh, uh, rotenone treatments and sterile, sterile tiger muskies. Uh, electric fishing, we've not done it in a single place in our state. Well, uh, in 2008, at a, at a lake trout conference, we heard about a new concept called Trojan Y chromosome approach. Didn't really know what that was. Came back, got the papers, and they looked like this. Uh, and, and they aren't for the math challenge. These are very strange figures. I could hardly understand those, but the math was all calculus. Um, and they use the term Trojan Y chromosomes. And I have since, in the papers, tried to change that to YY males. Uh, for policymakers, and I think you'll see why in a minute. Um, what, what is what is the YY male approach? Well, uh, it's all about a Punnett square, and we all know that what happens in a Punnett square with a female XX and an XY brook trout. Uh, you get 50-50 sex ratio. Uh, but watch what happens if you make a fish a YY. Uh, if you can build a genetic uh, YY fish and stock it on the landscape, all of its progeny will be male. That's all that ugly math aside, it's just that simple. That's what YY fish is, a very simple concept. Tools you need to, to uh, use such a program, uh, you need the ability to feminize a male fish. I'm not going to cover that in a lot of detail today, very, very briefly, uh, and you need a genetic sex marker. So if you've, if you've got those, uh, you're in, you, you know, you, in theory, you ought to be able to build a brood stock. How do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. In the case of brook trout, there is a recipe out there by a guy named John Stone, uh, and uh, you just uh, spray uh, feed that uh, with estradiol uh, and in the right concentration at the right time during sex differentiation, and voila, you can produce uh, a feminized fish. What does a feminized fish look like? Well, that is a male fish. Uh, if you look closely at the card, it's probably hard to see here, but that is an XY. We've tested it genetically. It's a male fish that's producing these eggs. So you have to have a sex marker to be able to pick out a brood stock. How do you do it? Again, in my other talks, uh, I spend some uh, good, good bit of time on this. I'm not going to here, but basically you need three generations in this approach, and you and you spawn these fish, you split the fry, you, you give them some estradiol feed, you do some genetics testing, you pick out the feminized XYs, you breed them with a regular male, you split them again, and lo and behold, you end up with a brood stock of fish, and you can produce hundreds of thousands, and right now we can produce five million uh, YY fish. That's our brood stock capability. So that's how you do it, and the uh, egg... Uh, producing fish are all genetically male fish, YY fish. Does this sound complicated or scary? Uh, you can tell that people go, oh God, this, this, this doesn't seem right. Well, just, just about every rainbow trout sold on the planet is a, um, uh, all female. It has uh, been treated, uh, its parents have been treated with methyl testosterone because nobody wants to eat a male a colored up rainbow trout. This became status quo in England in, I think, the 1990s. Uh, it's been uh, done all over the world. And like our YY males, all of these fish in the local grocery store or when you eat out at a restaurant, if you're eating a rainbow trout, it's almost likely the progeny of a sex reverse fish. So nothing too scary. It's, it's been around this method for 50 years. So YY males, they're not a GMO. There's no genetic engineering or gene splicing. That is the definition of a GMO. Uh, so if something goes wrong, if you're putting on the landscape, if you just stop stocking them, the sex ratio will just go back to 50-50. Uh, 
Uh, the estrogen that's released is t a tiny, tiny drop in a bucket compared to what's just flowing in from humans into our uh, sewage system, so that's not a concern. And we have worked with the FDA to get the uh, um, permission to use this drug to treat these fish and build a brood stock. So. so this is a paper that's been out since uh, 16. It's been hiding in NAJA and the North American Journal of Aquaculture. A lot of folks haven't seen it yet because it, uh, it kind of required us to put it there. They said this just couldn't put it in the transactions, um, but it's been, uh, uh, it's been out for a while. So uh, moving on then, the simulations, uh, you know, we built a brood stock, but before we really got into it, we wanted to uh, see what it would take uh, um, and how long would, could we expect uh, uh, it to work. I worked uh, with Dr. Hansen again, like I said, it seems like he, he, he's Idaho Fishing Game, the East Coast office every now and then. His boss is very supportive of that and we are grateful. Um, we did some simulations of streams and alpine lakes. I'm only going to show you the stream stocking very quickly today. We, we evaluated in this case fingerling stocking with the objectives to figure out how long would it take to actually extirpate, not just suppress, but extirpate a wild brook trout population from these kinds of waters and stock them at different rates. And secondly, we wanted to determine how much suppression uh, uh, at the t same time would influence eradication. We are fin clipping all of these fish. We can identify them. We can suppress electrofishing in streams, for example, and we can let our uh, YY fish go. Uh, and we wanted to use a model that looks like something we're used to, not a spaceship, like these prior two um, modeling studies that were out there. So we used a Leslie matrix. It's, it's all about fecundities and survival, but this is a, a classic wildlife and fisheries model. Um, and we used a, a Ricker model. So these are things that the average fish biologist can see. This had not been done in the literature for uh, YY before that. They, they've used some very strange models. So what do we see? Well, if you, if you suppress in a, in a brook trout stream and you get half the fish, which is the equivalent of about a one pass, you, you can go at it for 50 years and nothing will happen. You can go at it, you can suppress for 60 or 70 percent and generally nothing will happen. You need to be suppressing at 75 to 80 percent and you might, but who, not many agencies have the, the guts and the staying power to do that for that long and that effectively and you can't do it for a very long uh, a time. Well, when you, when you suppress it 50%, but you stock in YYs that are fin clipped and you can leave them in the stream, a, a very different result happens. So with good survival equal to wild fish, that's the top, that's the top plot. So basically it's the same survival as wild fish. Uh, our models suggested in streams, they'd go away in four years. If you had very poor, one fifth as good as survival, we estimated it would take around 10. So that got us pretty excited. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I don't have time to go into that today, but uh, anyway, we, we were very excited by this. And this is a table that kind of summarizes some results. This is suppression rate here, and this is the good survival and poor survival, and this is years to extirpation, and these are the stocking rates. And quickly, you see some very big numbers there. Those, uh, those aren't going to work. Clearly, a manager is not going to go with 50 years or even 20 or wh whatever. But there's a lot of smaller one numbers down there of years to extirpation with some of these stocking rates that we think are very reasonable to do in streams. This is the one I just showed you. Four years for good survival, and it was 12 years to, uh, with very poor survival. So the bottom line is when we saw this, we thought, okay, we're, we're, we're going to give this a go. Uh, th then the modeling summary and streams, we, we concluded that it would take four to 12 years and, and some examples, a little less depending. Uh, as I said, we, we published this paper, it, it was out uh, in 17, and um, that was it. We, we decided uh, it, while we were getting this uh, modeling done it's, uh, that it's time to go out and see if it in fact can be done. We, we used a pilot study and stock fish. Uh, on the landscape very quickly. We wanted to see if they would survive to spawn. Uh, we wanted to see if they would, can produce a, a offspring and will they be XY males. It's all about a genetics lab and the summary is survival. Uh, was that adequate? These are our wild fish and our hatchery fish in the bottom. You can definitely tell the difference. Spawn tining aligned with wild brook trout. They successfully reproduced and all the progeny were X mile, XY that we collected um, from Fry. And that paper just came out in the transactions. 
So uh, the Fulop trial is now underway. We're stocking in eight high, high mountain lakes, different sizes of fish. We're stocking in seven streams, and we're in it for real now. Can we shift the sex ratio? There is a potential fly in the ointment, and that is environmental sex determination. Their fish can uh, change sex, and, and not just the strange ones on reefs. Uh, it's, it's uncertain about brook trout. Nobody's ever looked at it. We think that it's going to not appear and rear its ugly head. We are doing an ongoing evaluation of ESD and brook trout in my uh, program. Uh, quickly then, on to Pond Array Lake Trout. Uh, it's the largest lake in Idaho. Lake trout collapse in that forage base. We wanted to see, I showed you this before, we wanted to see if we could make these things go away at the end uh, more handily. We spent eight million bucks so far, uh, and it's gonna require a lot of money to maintain this kokanee fishery. So we, we started on a preliminary production of, of YY lake trout at our Grace Hatchery. Uh, we've got feminization trials going. We have tried 12 different recipes. Those fish are swimming and I haven't had time to cut them yet. I think they're about ready for us to be able to look and see. So the future of lake trout research uh, is feminization trial successful and they, you know, they have this low uh, late maturity we're going to use a different approach to produce them. It'll, we're going to try to do it in one generation using androgenesis. Chuck Kruger's out there. He's published on a char, so he knows what I'm talking about. We're going to give this a go this fall and see if it's possible to produce a YY broodstock in one generation. Now, I, I'm not a, a hater of, of, of char, as I've told you before, and I've already been in contact with some folks from the east. Uh, I'm retiring in two months, happily, and I'm going to be working on YY fish pretty much full time. And I've already talked to them about going back there and helping build a YY rainbow trout brood stock. Um, to see if we can uh, help them out in the Smoky Mountains and in my home state of Pennsylvania. So, in summary, a tale of three chars. I yeah, had to jab the service a little. I think bull trout should be delisted across much of their range, certainly in Idaho. They're very abundant and they're not going down at all. We have some great data sets on that. Brook trout are formidable invaders and a few tools besides piscicides work. That's a tale of, uh, on brook trout. Lake trout can be suppressed in exotic populations with what I would call in my cans and commercial grade fishing power and, and lots of money. You gotta have staying power if you're gonna get in the fight, but it can be done. And I, if you, the spaghetti westerns have made it overseas, uh, we, we think that there's a new sheriff in town in eradication. It's called YY Males. It's not yet fully tested, um, but I think it has promise, and we're going to know about that in the next year or two. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Did I make it? Yeah, we have a couple minutes for questions. Like with other taxa, do you have a sense of that? Like, because uh, there's many, many invasives. This seems like yeah. could be yeah, useful for a lot of. I have one. Well, here, Don has one. I was just curious if you've done any modeling in the small alpine lake. It seems like it might be pretty successful there. We did, and I didn't present that. It's in the paper. The, it, it's harder because right now we model with gillnets that also kill our fish, so it's slowed it to the slower. I think more work needs to be done on other ways to trap and collect fish in high lakes.
more question we have time for. Who is multiple people? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, just uh, real quick, I'm curious if you get any kickback from uh, angling public. Thank you very much.